But the important thing in looking at, at Gaza is the fact that the West, you know, whatever thoughts they have, right? uh, whatever differentiate, whatever racism is loosely used as we, we defined it a few minutes ago, uh, translates into action. And it translates into action that justifies it in some cases is an accomplice to the worst crimes against humanity, atrocities, genocide. And that is a step, a jump, if you like, of absolutely critical importance. Hello, everybody. This is Pascal from Neutrality Studies, and today I'm talking again to Michael Brenner. Dr. Michael Brenner is Professor Emeritus of International Affairs at the University of Pittsburgh and a fellow at the Center for Transatlantic Relations at John Hopkins. Michael has been on this channel before, and we've usually talked about the grand themes in international relations, and we want to do the same again today because he wrote an essay recently about racism and this is the moment to discuss the role of bad old racism in the international system and the way international relations works. So, Michael, welcome back to the channel. Oh, thank you, Pascal. It's, it's my pleasure. I always appreciate the opportunity to, to talk with you. That essay of yours that really... Uh, that that spoke to me a lot because I did about a month ago a, a short program about the Gaza genocide and I came in that program to the very unsatisfactory conclusion that the only thing that can explain the West's and you know mainstream um, media kind of West the, the the overall approach of the collective West the only thing that can explain this heartless and cruel and cynical attitude toward the genocide happening, basically negating that it is one. And if they say like, yeah, crimes are being committed, then these crimes are being attributed more or less to the victims themselves. The only thing that explains this is racism. Now, racism is a very bad explanation because it's a non-explanation. <laughs> it's adding a label to something that we observe. But you, in this essay, you made some further um, you, further digging down. Could you maybe take us through the way that you see racism play out in this international relations game? Well, uh, to begin uh, to begin with, we have to pass the term racism, and because racism, particularly you know in English, you like, has begun to be used so promiscuously that it can refer to any form of bigotry, whether the basis for that bigotry is ethnicity, whether it's religion, whether it's skin color, whether it's language, or whether it's race. So we perhaps the more accurate or more appropriate term would be bigotry. But let's talk about, about racism and pose for us the further question, is there such a thing as race and why do we think in terms of, of race and designate peoples as constituting some race or, or other? Uh, it's a matter of, of, of scientific fact that there is no such thing as race. In other words, the DNA studies, which have now have been sort of conducted for you know, the past couple of decades, which seek to determine, you know, what the DNA constitution of various groups of, of individuals are, tell us that there is no such thing as anything like or even approximating a pure race. Each of us is a composition of DNA for which there is no identical match. And in fact, even persons who exhibit certain physical characteristics that seem to be very close, whether it be pigmentation or, or facial uh, features, uh, are not necessarily in DNA terms sort of very closely associated. The term race, therefore, simply is used or can be accurately used to refer to 
any uh, ensemble of people whose DNA resemble each other, not at all identical, simply resemble each other. And if that matched is certain by certain appearance or language or geographic location, we casually call that race. So there's no scientific basis for race, racism. But race, therefore, or particularly racism, um, therefore has to be understood in socio-cultural terms, or you could put it in political terms as well. In other words, it's a construction of highly organized sort of human societies, which probably began when you know small troops, most troops or tribes of, of human beings in Paleolithic times gradually expanded, you know, uh, formed themselves into communities and came and encountered, you know, other groups who looked somewhat different or spoke a different language or whatever. And so differentiation became natural. It need not always be, by its very nature, hostile, and it need not necessarily even be premised on the idea that we, our race, or our group is superior to another. I think those elements come into a play when you have encounters between, or can come into play, when you have encounters between large, very organized societies, and then it becomes a political, socio cultural phenomenon, which we've known about for 3,000 years, at, at least maybe 4,000 years, you know, since, since Neolithic times. Racism, to put this in some, some perspective, uh, we all know and have experienced and read about racism. It's in our mind and in, in our consciousness. The intriguing aspect of the current situation is that the members of, of Western liberal democratic societies, certainly, have all assumed that racism was something of the past and that to the extent that it existed within their own societies, it was being surmounted as racism directed at Blacks in the United States as was being surmounted and eclipsed, if you like. We also thought that with the end of the age of colonialism, which was based, or well, not based solely upon questions of race, um, the belief that the people that Western society subordinated and exploited for 400 years were inherently inferior and less civilized, so forth, was a convenient justification for the kind of economic control and political domination, which was at the heart of colonialism, imperialism, etc. And we also thought that that was history, and that uh, therefore wars or, or that approximate or conflicts that approximate anything like genocide would not involve Western countries one way or another. In other words, like the genocide in, in Rwanda. Mm -hmm. That was seen as something unspeakable that had occurred among peoples who um, hadn't reached the level of enlightened social organization that, that we had for whatever reason, right? And it was universally condemned. Therefore, now we find ourselves in a situation in which Western countries are accomplices to genocide, genocide by any measure, by any def definition, and are actively uh, active accomplices in one form or another. And some of Western countries, particularly the United States and its sidekick, Great Britain, if you like, are co-belligerents 
the United States that not only provides armaments to the Israeli government, ammunition without which they could not conduct their the rampage, either in Gaza or in Lebanon and now, now, now Syria, but in which the United States uh, Air Force and Navy have been involved in providing vital intelligence to the Israelis in their attacks on Iran. Also intelligence involving Hezbollah, the successful Israeli assassination of Hezbollah leadership depended, I'm told by people who are in the know, dependent critically on American intelligence assets and that the extraordinarily powerful bombs used also provided by the United States and the United States Navy it was has been involved in trying to defend Israel against rockets and missiles launched from by the Houthis in, in Yemen and Iran. So the two Anglo-Saxon countries which are probably the oldest democracies in, in the West, are co-belligerents. In other words, they are active, if not full, participants in manifest actions of genocide. Let me just note two other quick, quickly features before we you know, delve further into this, of the current situation. One is that there's no mystery about what's going on. We see it in graphically, in color, 24 hours a day, it's, uh, it's in no way concealed or masked. Second, the Israeli leadership publicly states their intention to commit genocide. At least some of them do. Ministers have. Former I, you know, IDF generals have. Uh, and that is, again, unique, right? And the third is the, the, the third singular feature, which is un, unprecedented, is that this degree of, of engagement on the part of the West, on the side of, let's, let's use the correct term, on the side of manifest evil, is being made despite the fact that there is no interest political security or economic interest in what the Israelis are doing. In fact, I think it's it's a simple calculus, and the evidence we have will tell us that the United States and the Europeans have suffered in terms of a diminution of their standing in the world and their influence uh, you know, considerably as a result of what they're doing. So given all of those, those unique elements, that's the question we left with, and you began, you posed at the outset, how do we, how do we explain it? Yeah. And that upset me trying to explore the depths of our leaders and our society's sort of collective uh, psychopathology. And in the discussions with you, we often do this. We go this route and we teether on the brink of between philosophy and sociolo uh, philosophy and psychology mm -hmm. because there's an there's this element there and I can't quite work it out yet, but war has this tendency to at least, I mean, for all the death and destruction, at least it clarifies a couple of things, as in it makes them plain and obvious. And we, we, despite the propaganda, you know, if you cut through what one or the other side wants to make you believe, and if you just look at what's what what happens with what what you can see with your own eyes, and what we can see with our own eyes is what we are being reported on, right? And we see the reports. I mean, we see the videos coming out of Gaza. Um, we see also what what the what journalists and what CNN and so on wants to show us, right? And we can here make a little parallel with the with the war in Ukraine. Which also had this 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 clarifying element when it comes to race, which was at the very beginning when a large number of Ukrainians fled Ukraine and came across the border into Poland and into the European uh, into the European Union. You had a couple of days in which uh, uh, reporters from Europe 
really were shocked and literally said, these are not normal migrants. These are white people, uh, blonde hair, blue <clears throat> eyes. You remember that, right? And we've had that where they say, like, this is a real crime, you know, because these people are white. <laughs> they, they, they almost said it. I mean, one of these, the blonde, blue eye, the, the guy actually said it. And this is a mindset, right, that then that then kind of surfaces suddenly and shows you that that mm. the Europeans still think of like migrants and so on as something like a different skin color. It's it, it's not supposed to be to be to be this. There's this group feeling um, and. And there, I just, I mean, for whatever is happening right now in, in um, West Asia, it is plain and obvious that the allegiances of the Anglo-Saxon world and the wider European world is with the people of the same skin color. And one of the tricks that Israel did or that, 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 that the Zionists did is, of course, rebrand themselves as not European while still remaining so, right? I mean, Netanyahu and, and Galan and so on. They're all European Jews. They're all they're all they're all entrenched in these 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 groups of people straight mm. out of Europe, and settler colonial taking over the land of people with actually a different skin color of theirs, and now taking the liberty to just exterminate the people of that skin color. And and you and I and and the, the student protesters um, in 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 the U.S. and a lot of people in the entire global South see that and perceive that and understand that. And that's why it's so obvious. But then, but then, kicks in the psychological element in Western societies that believe of themselves to be anti-racist and to have overcome mm -hmm. the sins of the past, but they are <clears throat> unable to psychologically understand that they are again inflicting, yeah. you know, a nineteenth-century version of a crime. And they, they even justify that and they get angry when when we confront them with this analysis of their racism. They mm. they will get very mad. And I had people throwing a drink away in front of me and storming off for, you know, disagreeing with uh, with their version of reality in which in which the West is is just helping to defend the victim from the brown aggression, right? From the bearded Muslim Islamist right, right. terrorism. Uh, can you speak to that? Well, it's a very, you've already given a very cogent depiction of the situation and the paradoxes that, and contradictions. You know, a cu couple of thoughts. One is a strong tendency, of course, to, to label the people you support the good guys in your mind who become good guys for a variety of reasons. Let's <clears throat> suspend that question for, for, for the moment as being like you. Hmm? So the Ukrainians, of course, are, to me, the interesting thing is not just that the Ukrainians are something recognized blue eyed and blonde like us uh, immigrants, because that, that is unusual in an empirical sense, since large waves of refugees, particularly, in, well, going back some time, but I mean, even the last couple of decades, has been involved people from the greater Middle East, or from Latin America and the United States, or from South Asia, coming into North American and European societies. So suddenly when you get a wave of immigrants from places like Ukraine, it is striking that they look uh, characteristically Caucasians and Caucasians of, of, of the most perfected kind, if you might say, the purest form. But what's interesting there too is that the Russians are not given that status and privilege. Russians, after all, are just as blonde and blue-eyed as Ukrainians. And don't forget, you know, it was the Russians of the Bunba, of the Donbas who suffered atrocity at the hands of the Ukrainians in 1914, uh, sorry, 2014 and 2015. The, the thousands of Russians, Ukrainian Russians, Russians of Ukrainian nationality who were burned alive in Odessa. And there were 14,000 Russians who were killed between 
2014 and 2022 in the Donbass by Ukrainian artillery, which was indiscriminately directed at civilian uh, civilian targets or popu- population. So it turns out that even this sort of convenient uh, readiness to label all, all, all the good guys as, or to see them as members of your own race, your own people, if you like, it, it doesn't really hold up when you shed light on it because you have this, this way, you know, striking case in point is the differentiation between Russians and Ukrainians. Yeah. <laughs> it's, as if, it's as if the West is saying, Jesus, those Russians, they should be brown skinned. Hmm? And that, that that is true. That is true. And and let me just interject one one personal experience about Switzerland. Um, our largest immigrant group, apart from the Germans, um, uh, is actually the the people from the former Yugoslavia, Serbia, Croatia, Bosnia, Herzegovina, uh, and so on. And the Swiss. This is the the, the group that they are most racist against. And I, my some of my my best friends are from Serbia and Croatia. And and and. Um, Serbia and Bosnia. And when I talked about this and the kind of the daily racism that they still rec- uh, encounter now in Switzerland, uh, the little things, um, then, and then I showed my former, my former partner and so for the first time their picture, you know, the two of them. Mm. He, he's, he's Taiwanese and he, he looked at me and he said, oh, but Pascal, but they're white. I was like, yeah, yeah, that's true. I mean, also in Switzerland and other societies, we manage to create racial um, racial lines that, mm. that that don't they don't need to be defined by by skin by skin color or facial features. Right, right. But but somehow we are able to do that. The, the Europeans we are able to include and exclude people from the from these groups and then map map all of these negative right. stereotypes on them and then treat them in a way that then the in group feels entitled to treat right. that out group because the out group right. it's their own well, mistake. You know the the the, the British term wog which is an acronym for Worthy Oriental Gentleman, which is a disparaging term, which the British characteristically applied to Asians, particularly whether nowadays, I think it was particular, uh, uh, especially to East Asians, if you like, mm-hmm. the people whom in American slang or in military some military slang referred to as slants because of the Mongolian fold, the, the formation of, of, of their eyes. And, you know, one could hear people joking in Britain, I mean, recently in that series, saying, well, you know, the wogs begin at Calais. Hmm? Ah. You know, where you run into the the frogs, you know. Yeah, and the French. Let's, let, let's come back though to to the Middle East and and to Gaza, because I think there's an important distinction be to, to be made between us unjustified differentiations we make with negative and pejorative connotations about other peoples how we see them, how we perceive them, uh, and how we we think about them from behavior. Now, the United States, which has always been a melange of peoples, if you like, when I was brought up in New York City, there are always disparaging words around for every ethnic group of varying degrees of, of, of derogation, if you like which you never used in, in polite society. Uh, by the time I was going, you could occasionally use them almost facetiously. But often the reference was made of people with no hostility whatsoever and whose own conduct really didn't make any significant differentiation. You know. In other words, it was just I don't know what almost just became part of the you know the, the slang. 
But the important thing in looking at, at Gaza is the fact that the West, you know, whatever thoughts they have, right? uh, whatever differentiate, whatever racism is loosely used as we, we defined it a few minutes ago, uh, translates into action. And it translates into action that justifies it in some cases is an accomplice to the worst crimes against humanity, atrocities, genocide. And that is a step, a jump, if you like, of absolutely critical importance. Everyone walks around in their mind with all kinds of prejudicial labels, differentiations, and that, to some degree, to some people almost none, others quite a number, but it doesn't necessarily translate into behavior, either on a person-to-person -person behavior or on a broader scale in terms of relations, uh, you know, across you know, across countries. But we've made that step. And we've made that step in lockstep. Yeah. And nobody, no government, at least, leaders, except for the Irish and the Spanish, yes. have exempted themselves. But this... Everybody else is almost enthusiastically caught up, is caught up in it. And let's remember after all, October 7th, which was and some atrocious. I mean, it's been exaggerated how much carnage was produced. I mean, half of the people killed apparently were killed by Israeli forces, commandos and aircraft who lost all control and killed their own people trying to escape in cars and including in that, that, that arena. And 300 were Israeli security and uh, military people. So you're left with some hundreds and no children were beheaded and no, none were thrown into ovens. And it would appear too that most of the atrocities such as they were were not committed, some war probably by Hamas, but once the breach was made in the war, well, all kinds of people with revenge in their minds, including some criminal gangs crossed over and other ones apparently mainly re responsible for it. Anyway, but after October 7th, remember, every Western leader immediately flew to Jerusalem, including President Biden, embraced Netanyahu, and told him, we're behind you, you can do whatever you want. We will not question it. Yeah. And, and, and the enthusiasm over the subsequent couple of weeks as it began, the indiscriminate assault on civilian areas in uh, Gaza right, was also enthusiastically supported by Western political elites. You know, someone I know used a very crude metaphor, simile. He said Western leaders raced to J Jerusalem like a, a you know a bunch of guys from a motorcycle gang, uh, you know, racing to get in on a gang rape. Well, that's extreme. Yeah, but, but I mean, it is. It is. It was. Uh, it is incredible. I mean, to me, it is. In, it is incredible that we see this going on, and that you know, you have a lot of people understand. I mean, the United Nations actually. Uh, Guterres actually said, like, there's there's limits to what you can do. And Francesca Albanese and and people who do understand that this is a genocide mm. that needs to be stopped. Right. And that even even if you disagree with the label of genocide, I mean, we can agree that the, the level of of dying is utterly, utterly mm. atrocious. Right. But then but then you already get into these these discussions about who is to blame for it and, and who, who does what. And it all ends up in this in this dichotomy of uh, uh, right to self-defense so-called versus uh, uh, um, uh, terrorism, uh, Islamic terrorism. Right. Um, uh, but the the question to me and i would like to come back to that is that um despite 
the understanding of how racism works. And it, the Holocaust on the Jews in the Second World War is another form of that, right? And we, we understand that. And in Europe, we learn that. And we, we, we study from 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 an, from early times in school how the depiction of jews as like having crooked noses and special facial features how that is an was an important part in the uh, mm. psychology that created the fertile ground upon which then the holocaust was built and the the um mm. the, the ability to kind of re really like put people in concentration camps and put them into um into uh, uh, ghettos, right? Because that was known. The Holocaust, mm. the, 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 the extermination of these people was was not known until a later point within the large larger society. But the ghettos mm. and so on, the, the, the ghettoification, that was, was well understood and known. And, and that was justified, right? We understand all of this. Um, and still, then, when it happens again, then... The, a good part of this of society doesn't actually understand that it's happening again. It's like it's as if though all of these things, all of these signs, all of these these very clear mm -hmm. signals suddenly, even though mm -hmm. they're still there, they are switched off in the brains, or they don't they don't they don't mm -hmm. register anymore. Um, do you do you because that's well, that's. That is that's then where it well, becomes well, international relations. That's then where entire groups then suddenly are able to use the bombs and the forces that they created in order to commit this crime of crimes. Right. Well, of course, this is the ultimate tragedy. Yeah. That people who had been abused and scorned and eventually a large portion of whom had been exterminated in, in the 20th century uh, and had been stigmatized in this way over two almost two millennia become the perpetrators of the very atrocities which they themselves endured for some of them within living memory so i mean this raises a, a you know two or three absolutely profound psychological questions one having to do with the mentality of those Jews who are perpetrating these crimes. And by the way, you know, 80 to 90 percent of the Israeli population races of all surveys uh, unqualifiedly support what their government is doing in, in Gaza. So it's not just the psychology of the political elites and leaders that that we have looked at. When you turn to to West to Europe, I mean, when we can say that reality has become too plex for enlightened opinion to bear. So, you know, opinion which is like like the uh, the mental maps of all of all of us simplify reality. And central elements in the European political classes and society general mental map was uh, the Jews are victims, hmm? and we bear a guilt for what we did to them. And it's true. I mean, we 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 think of the Holocaust as a purely German. Thing. It wasn't. Every occupied European country, I think, with one exception, I forget which it is. Bulgaria, perhaps, provided at least one SS division. And in fact, the country that provided the most, three or four, was Ukraine. Self-identified Ukrainians. And then, of course, there's a notorious bond, you know, Bandera, who was the leader of the Ukrainian Nazis and who, you know, himself conducted his, his group uh, atrocities and killing tens of thousands of Jews and almost as many Poles as well. And that's the man to whom the current government has built statues and after whom they've named squares and, 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 and streets. Anyway, you don't want to get in, you know, into Ukraine at, at this point. But the point I was making was the guilt 
about the victimization of Jews historically in the Holocaust uh, was felt to varying degrees, not just by the Germans, but I think many other Europeans as well. Okay, so in their mental map, from this, the Jews are victims and we owe them something. Hmm? And I think when you answer that, the latent, let's just call it racism in some form or another, that devalues non-Western peoples, whether consciously, subconsciously, with what connotations, it's highly variable, right? But it does view them as somehow inferior, or oh, inferior takes on, you know, strictly, you know, purely racial terms, as being somehow different and of less value. Let's just use that term, of less value. So you combine the two, you know, the powerful feelings of, uh, of guilt for about the Jews and therefore the imperative to support them, to support Israel, against the devaluation of these brown people. Mm. Although if you look at the coloration of Palestinians and Jews from the Middle East, there's not, a, there's not very much difference in terms of, of color. Now, let me just add to that point. There, yeah, but then the question still arises. Right? Mm. If, though, you see the gruesome atrocities being perpetrated, which involves not just shooting and killing, but snipers targeting children, bombing maternity hospitals. Mm -hmm. And you see it, it's graphic, right? And you see Israeli soldiers humiliating in the grossest ways, Palestinians. One would have thought whatever the, the biases which derive from the mental map, that we call it, of Westerners, that when you see this, there should be, one would, ex should be, one would expect an instinctive reaction, which says, this is intolerable, this is unbearable, can not be done. I mean, after all, that's also in our nature. I mean, when you see a child about to fall off a cliff or whatever, the human instinct is to try and save it, and you don't think about and empathy, the coloration, the pigmentation, the features, and so forth. And that is then become routinized in your in, in human communities, first through the bonding and solidarity of peoples who know each other directly, and then in larger societies, you know, through socialization and culturalization, and even laws and rules and certainly so social norms. None of that, though has surfaced among our political elites and our governments. In other words, one would naturally have expected when you see what's actually happening, you know, that these powerful sentiments should arise and override all of the biases from a complex set of sources and causes which have led you initially to write a blank check yeah. for the Israeli government. And one has not seen that. You've seen it, yes, among certain groups. You've seen it among individuals. You've seen it among those who demonstrate and so forth. You have not seen it among the West political class. So and if you, excuse, if you excuse it, just one more word. And if you excuse, uh, you know, some street language, this strongly suggests there is something wrong with Western societies. They are sick, they are perverse, they are pathological in that sense, in a clinical sense. And that's the great mystery. How did they become such? Or it's not pathological, or it's part of the mechanism that 
the the kind of racism that we are talking about now the racism that enables mass violence is the its very function is that it is able to constrain and channel empathy to the groups where you want it to be applied to let's say let's say the ukrainians maternity hospital in 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 ukraine gets hit by a uh, by debris or by 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 something like connected to the war right whether the russians targeted mm. it or not whether it was it was an accident or not it doesn't matter it gets hit and then huge outcry huge empathy huge how could this happen it's 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 innocent civilians al shifa hospital in in palestine gets gets bombed to ashes twice uh, like raided and 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 hundreds of patients die and uh, being like killed and you know the um, uh, uh, hospital personnel is being uh, humiliated in front of the in in front by by soldiers everything is is on film and on tape it's even paraded by the perpetrators online and the the the, the western reaction to that one is well israel had to enter the hospital right it had to clear the hospital like this 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 sanitizing language that is then applied in order to differentiate these two cases and the racism itself has the function of making sure that empathy is applied to one and not to the other one which would be the the normal reaction yes. right yes. but beyond that so if racism has a function to make sure that certain acts of violence can be committed my question though is is it the ultimate thing to explain what's happening or is there something on top of racism you know something to which racism is a tool in order to get that like the the structure of 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 societies or the the structure of power in the international system of how power is yielded and racism is a tool in order to to, to wield that um, i haven't thought this through but do you have any any thoughts on this well, I think there you have to look at individuals. And there are leaders of the United States government you know, who have been wedded to the idea for the past 30 years since the collapse of the Soviet Union that the United States had the opportunity, had the imperative, uh, had occasion to fulfill a prophecy or a mission with which he was endowed at his birth as in a condition of original virtue, whether providentially anointed or not, right? or in a crudest sense to establish American hegemony. And this was all laid out in the notorious Wolfowitz memo of March 1991, which it, it, when it was first promulgated uh, was had to be um, rejected formally by the Bush presidency because of how candid it was in, in terms of making the case for a very crude form of realpolitik, imperial realpolitik. That has become of the intellectual framework shared by the large, very large majority of the American foreign policy community. And so you can say in that sense, yes, the United States or some of its leaders, or most of its leaders, if you like, are inclined to overlook the atrocities in Gaza are inclined to give this carte blanche to the Israeli government, reinforced by things like campaign donations on the rest, which are very important, yeah? uh, because it's part of the broader project of institutionalizing American global dominance. There are people who do think in those terms, in which case, some of them both are committed to that and are personally not racist. Okay. What the percentages are, there are mixes too, I mean, because people are not clearly, cannot clearly be, be placed in one or another category. Their psychologies are too complex. When you turn to Europe, though, 
There was no grander strategic objective in the minds of anyone, really. Uh, its followership, you know, its followership of the United States, which of course is is is, is dovetails with and complements what we've been talking about European attitudes towards Jews, towards Israel, historical guilt, and negative uh, conceptions of brown people and particularly non-Christian brown people whom Western societies colonized and exploited and dominated for, what, 400, 400 years. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, in a way, the European uh, political psychology of, of its elites is even more of a mystery than that of American political elites. I mean, in a, in a way, it does make sense to me if we think of it in racial terms, especially in not 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 in the the skin color, because if you look only at skin color and fa and features, then you're absolutely right. I mean, the Russians and and Balkans and so on should all be part of that, but they're not. But if the imagined race, right, the yeah. the who belongs together kind of race concept, the the one where we already exclude others there you do see that the europeans and especially i mean the west europeans which by now is like starts somewhere in poland right, um, right. is uh is a community an epistemic racial community the transatlantic community that officially of itself says we belong together and in that sense right. the europeans right. don't look at themselves as different right because the whole point of of this racial inclusion is that you are the same and you part you you say that right you can be black black, white, uh, uh, yellow, American, black, white, yellow, uh, uh, European, but we are all transatlantic, we belong together, we even transcend the national, right? We are, we are, we are one. And as one, well, there's other ones that belong to us that are under attack in the Middle, in the Middle East, in West Asia, and we need to defend those ones of ours from the, mm -hmm. uh, from the, from the, from the barbaric horde. So in that sense, it would it would yeah. ring to me that 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 they so we we are we are leaving the the the, the framework of like uh, nation states and so on and the Mearsheimer and what's best for 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 this group or that group yeah. because the group looks at itself together at least these elite kind kind of mental framework maybe. Well, there's a fascinating paradox here, though. Not though. I mean, there's a fascinating paradox in this situation specific to Jews and Israel and Westerners' view of them and how they're conceptualized and, and so forth. Of course, Jews, well, as we said historically, were the quintessential other since they're the people who were responsible for the crucifixion of Christ. And the other hand, even that theologically, I, I mean, a one-minute parenthesis, if it was God's plan to send his only begotten human son to save humankind from the condition of original sin, right, then this was all programmed in advance. And so whoever participated in that, including Judas, were following a script. They were essential actors, and therefore they should be recognized as such. But let's leave that. That's a theological issue. Yeah, the the I mean, Christian theology uh, theology is a is a house of insanity of its own that we better walk around yeah. at the moment. <laughs> let's 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 tread gently on that ter territory. But let me give me another point about the paradox again. So the Jews who were the ultimate other. Huh? became honorary Westerners, Cajun, whatever, if you like. And yet what we've discovered recently through DNA investigations, that the Jews in DNA terms are not really that much of the other. 
Now, this is something which gets very little publicity for reasons that will become obvious, and that is DNA studies have been done of samples, representative samples, whatever that is. For example, of Ashkenazi Jews, Jews originated in Central, Eastern, Northern Europe. And what they discovered, and they, each of these studies has some differences and their ranges and, and so forth, is that Ashkenazi Jews, for the most part, on average, uh, have DNA of Levantine, that means Israel, Lebanon, you know. The land that was given by Yahweh to the Jews right, is only between 20 and 30 percent. Between 20 and 30 percent, 20 and 25 percent DNA derives from Mesopotamia and Iran, which is understandable given the fact that one was in the 6th century BC, the Babylonian captivity. Mm -hmm. Roughly 20 to 25 percent is Southern European. In other words, no different from Italian, Sicilian, Greeks, whatever, if you like, Maltese. And about 20 percent, again, roughly Northern European. You know, in an all the European element when it came in, because you know the, the the Jews who first began to settle in the Rhineland in in Roman times were probably merchants or, or craftsmen or so on, who married local women who converted and so forth. So that's probably rather than the conversion of whole families or tribes, including men. Anyway, so that's the breakdown. Hmm? They done the same with Sephardic Jews. Sephardic Jews being Jews who from Spain and were expelled, expelled. And in the Ottoman Empire, the Spanish Jews were welcomed into the Ottoman Empire, just the way the Polish kings during the Middle Ages had welcomed the Jews who were cast out of Central and Western Europe. Did uh, differentiate between the Jews coming from Spain and Portugal, the Iberian Jews, and the Middle Eastern Jews who had long been resident there. But that's just an aside, if you like. Anyway, the breakdown of the Sephardic Jews is again uh, 25 to 30% Levantine, about 20 to 25% again. Mesopotamian, Iranian, uh, 25 to 30% Southern Mediterranean makes sense, and a smaller slice of Northern European, but some, 10 to 15%, and always there's 5% others, people from the Caucasus, Berbers, so on and so forth. Less work has been done of Middle Eastern Jews, in other words, Jews who came to Israel from Iraq, from Syria, from, from Egypt, right? But the breakdown there is not drastically different. Again, it's about 30% Levantine, you know, large component from Mesopotamia, right? large Southern European, 5% Berber, if you like, and so on. So, overall, among the, the Jews in Israel today, roughly a quarter, a maximum 30% of their DNA would be shared with the Jews of the Old Testament. I know this is touching a very delicate ground, but I, you know, it's not the basis necessary for any definitive political judgments, but it does demonstrate how the very notion of race and the we and the them and we and the other, how, how illogical and absurd it is. By the way, there have been some preliminary, less thorough studies of Palestinians. 
And the outstanding fact there is that in general, there are about 50% Levantine. You should add one other fact, which is that Israeli law prohibits the pursuit, the conduct of DNA investigations. So really? let's, each of us can make of that whatever. whatever. I mean, it's, it is it is an interesting topic to discuss, but the, the imagined groups, the in-groups and the out-groups, you know, the, the kind of, I think that's where I'm most concerned about this topic of racism because it's the thing that then allows societies again to use mass violence. Mm -hmm. And it's not, I don't think that Israel is particular in that kind or is, is special. I think it is a, a the latest version of something extremely European which is to to at some point blow up a social group that used to work together if you look at the this development of, of european societies over the past 1000 years what you see is you have larger empires building which necessarily by the way they work are uh, an amalgamation mm -hmm. of different kinds of religions ethnicities races languages uh, you name it right, right? Uh, uh, eating habits, right? And then the, they work for a time and then it's something blows them up. If you look at how uh, Yugoslavia disintegrated and how the Serbs and, 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 and the, the, the Croats started killing each other, like really mm -hmm. violently. And the fact then that the, the lines of Serbs and Croats, they didn't go through like defined territories. Mm -hmm. They were literally neighbors which meant that for the time that they lived as neighbors, mm. it worked, <laughs> it was fine. And then something, something kicked in that started the, them differentiating, mm. and then it was not fine anymore. <laughs> and well, well, of course, the, I mean, there, there was an infinite variety of terms of relationship between social groups. Mm. You know, Stephen said, imagine, you know, when it was first discovered that we all have almost all of us, except sub-Saharan Africans, even some of them, by the way, between two and four and five percent Neanderthal DNA. Mm. And, 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 and Southeast Asians have two to four percent of Denisovan DNA on top of it. You can just think, well, how, do, how did these, these, these people interact? And the most sensible suggest, idea I've heard is, well, at times they cooperated, at times they ignored each other, at times they fought each other. That's human nature. You, that's the nature of you, human society. But again, what's unique about the Israeli situation is, of course, they were not a fixed element in the neighborhood until Zionism. Yeah, true. So you have this whole, you know, very I mean, there, were, there, were the, there were the Jews in, in that well, region, but they were Jew. integrated there, in society. There was, there was a Jewish community in, 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 in Jerusalem, throughout, and probably even after the, the temple, Second Temple was destroyed, not all the Jews were kicked out of, of Judea and so forth. They might have been kicked out of Jerusalem for a while, but on the countryside, they probably just villages kept living as they as they always had. So yeah, I mean you've had a Jewish community in Jerusalem for three thousand years, but that's entirely different from the settler community, which is what it is, that began in the late nineteenth century and then was legitimized by the Balfour Declaration. And if you want to be cynic, well I've I think we've touched on enough sensitive topics. So, I hold in abeyance one more that I was going to toss out. But. We we are also reaching the one hour mark, and I try to be you know, <laughs> discussions like these they they need they need processing time also in our audience. So, Michael Brenner, thank you very much for your time today. It's been my pleasure. Thank you, Pascal.